Sonny asked the question, what are we studying? We're going to straighten out all the things about Ecclesiastes that Paul messed up. Okay? We're going to get this straight today. It's kind of a difficult situation. Do you remember back in school, if you can remember back that far, when you had to get up in front of the class and give a talk and the teacher was there and you thought, man, I, that scared me to death. I don't like teaching when the teacher's here. Number one, you can't talk about him in front of him, but uh, I, I, I was thinking about this. Uh, I, I really enjoy teaching. Because I get to share with you some things that let you know that my mind works differently from most people. I, my wife looks at me sometimes and she says, where do you come up with that idea? I don't know. Sometimes I think too much, I believe, and sometimes I don't think enough. And I think we're all that way sometimes. And I, I begin to. I did exactly what the teacher asked us to do last week. He said, go back and read Ecclesiastes again. And I did that. I read it. One thing I, I found in my life is that I'm a very slow reader. And because I think it's from being in engineering school in college, I had to read textbooks very slowly to understand them. And now when I when I read even the scriptures, I get to a certain verse and I'm stuck. And it takes me forever to get over that. And I was thinking, you know, if people are different, let me ask you a question. How do you learn? How do you learn? Some of us learn from the instructions from other people. You know, I'll, I'll learn a lot. I'll, I'll give him credos today. I learn an awful lot from Paul. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy and, and I find it interesting to go back into the Greek and the Hebrew and, and, and listen to what those words actually meant to the person who was hearing them at that particular time. I've learned a lot from reading, from reading textbooks, from reading other things. I think about what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He said, when you read what I've written, you'll understand my knowledge of the mystery of Jesus Christ. And I thought, that's, that's so, that's so, perfect because the things scriptures say those things that were written before time were written why for our learning for our learning we learn a lot through reading we learn a lot through our own achievements and our own failures I don't know how many times I've tried and failed at certain things. I, I, I sometimes feel like Thomas Edison, and I've shared this with you a lot. Edison was once asked, he said, don't you get frustrated? He said, you worked, he worked on this light bulb so many times. He said, I know 900 ways not to make a light bulb. We learn through our failures. We learn through the achievements and failures of others, if we're smart. One of his contemporaries once asked Sir Isaac Newton, how, how, did, you, how did you reach this level of knowledge? How did you discover all these relationships of nature? 
how did you get all this put together? He said, it's very simple. I can see farther because I stand on the shoulder of giants. I thought about this when uh, I was watching television the other day about people who don't learn from the failures of others. This is probably a statement about my stupidity, but did you see the did you see the uh, commercial? I think it's about the new phone that's out. This guy sticks his tongue to a lamppost. Any of you seen that? If that guy had called me, if he had only called me, I could tell him what would happen when he does that. I know. I know from experience. I didn't do it on purpose. But for some reason, I we had a lock on our garage. And, and I was trying to unlock it one day. And, and it was frozen. So I thought, if you just blow on it, if you blow on it long enough and hard enough, sooner or later your tongue will accidentally slip out of your mouth. And your tongue will slip and stick to a lock. I did not have to have a bandage put on the tongue, but I can tell you what it feels like to tear the skin off the end of your tongue. Sometimes we're encouraged to do things because people tell us not to do those things. I told the story about John Temple, a good friend of mine. A lot of you know John. John said out of the clear blue one day, his mother said, don't stick those beans up your nose. He said, I never thought about that. That never crossed my mind. And I thought, wonder why she told me not to do that. And he says, so I tried it. I know why she told me not to do that. After a visit to the emergency room. And when I look at scriptures, you know, the, the I don't like to say the older I get the more of life I experience, this book works. It works not only in this building right here, among us as brothers and sisters in Christ, it works outside these walls. This is the best how to live book you'll ever find. And, and it amazes me at, at how well, it's put together. It's as though God planned to pull all these things together to show us how to live. He gives us, you know, Paul wrote this to Timothy, he said, all scripture given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What we need in life, not just in this building, but what we need in life is in here. We look, we look at the example of, of people we find in here and we see what they did and how they were successful and we think, I can learn from his successes. I look at, at individuals in here and I see how they were able. I look at people like Joshua and Caleb. And I think it, they had courage to stand up when everybody else said, this won't work. This won't work. And I, I think about how much courage that took when, when the majority of those spies came back and only two of them stood up and said, we can do this. No, no, no. And I thought, how many church fellowship meetings have I ever been in where the majority of the people said, 
You know, we tried that once before. That didn't work. This book tells me about the successes of people. And then I read Ecclesiastes again. And I thought, why is this book, Ecclesiastes, why did God see fit to put it in here? Paul may have said it, or Steve once said it. It's it's written in the most cynical manner you'll ever read. And it's hard to, to go back through Ecclesiastes and find positive things in it. And I thought, why is this book in here? You know, the scriptures contain so much information. You want to know the history of the earth? Read Genesis. You want to know how it started? Read Genesis. You want to know how it ends? Read Revelation. You want to know how the history of the Israelite nation came together and how they became such a powerful people? Read First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings. You want to know about all the prophecies that we see fulfilled in the life and times of Jesus Christ? Read Isaiah. You want to know about how the church started and how it grew and how it functioned as a, as a complete entity and how everything worked together? Read the book of Acts. You want to be confused and confounded and, and struggle through something and, and think about how, how rigid and legalistic the writings can be? Read Romans. You want to know how to live a a Christian life in a daily basis, read the book of James. Best how-to book ever written about living a Christian life. You want to know how not to do something? Read the book of Ecclesiastes. I often wondered about Solomon. How could a man become so cynical? in such a short period of time. Have you ever really thought about Solomon and his life? Solomon was probably, and a lot of these are, these dates and ages I give you are, are, are the best I can come up with. Solomon, a, a lot of his may come from his family history. You know, a lot of us do things because that's the way our family did it. You heard the story about the lady getting ready to cook Thanksgiving, brought the ham in, cut the end of the ham off, put it in a roasting pan, put it in the oven. And her daughter said, Mama, why do you cut the end of the ham off? She said, I don't know. My mother always did it. Well, let's call Grandma and find out. So they called Grandma. Grandma, why, why did you cut, why do we cut the end of the ham off and put it in the roasting pan? She said, I don't know why you did it. But I did it because the ham was too big for the pan. But we do think. If you watch yourself, you'll notice uh, if there was, if anyone ever loved their father and wanted to be like their father, I'm it. I, I thought, I thought he walked on water. Now, I found out later that, yeah, he had his faults. But I find myself now doing things like he always did them. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard a song by Chet Atkins called My Father's Hat. He talked about the fact that when he was a child, and, and I relate to this, and I break down every time I hear this song, because... 
I know exactly what he means. He talked about he would go in when nobody was looking. And he would climb up on the closet shelf and he would get his father's hat down and he would put it on. He said, I'd put it on, fix the brim. I wanted to be like him. I find myself now, I always put on my left shoe first. Why? Because that's what my dad always did. I don't, why do you do that? Well, I don't know. Well, I do it now. I work crossword puzzles in the paper. Why? Because that's the way he did. And I even find myself when I, I, I still read, I get to Tennessee and then I read it. Those of you who have these little tablets, you ain't right. I'm sorry. If you, if you, can't, if you can't lick your finger and turn the page, you, you're not reading. And I find myself now opening up the paper, and, and I learned this from him. The pages stick together. Have you noticed that? But if you blow on them, they'll open up. And I thought, I do that because he did it. I think Solomon, Solomon is probably, uh, he's probably born sometime around, David may be close to 50 years old when Solomon is born. David will live to be about 70. He pretty well predicted it when he said man's years are three score year and ten, and if by measure of strength they be four score. Yes, he's exactly right. He lived 70. Solomon was probably, if Archie's right, he's probably the maybe the tenth son of David. When he's born, there's already a ton of kids in David's family. David has one special son when Solomon is born. Son by the name of Absalom. I think part of Solomon's cynicism comes from being raised in a dysfunctional family. Now, some of us think we come from strange family. I, I, I would almost dare say that nobody in here had a brother who killed another brother because that brother raped his sister. I dare say that none of us in here had a father that had killed my mother's previous husband because she was with child. Now, we, we sometimes think we live in a dysfunctional world. Think about where Solomon grew up. Now, I've often wondered what, how did Solomon feel about David? I think he held David in real high regard. Let, let, let me share with you a writing of Solomon from Proverbs chapter 4. Here's what he says. Hear, my children, the instructions of a father. Give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother. He also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words. I think as Solomon grows older, he looks back and, have you ever had somebody that said, do as I say, not, as I do. You know, we look at Solomon and we think, how, how could he have done some of the things he did? Had what? 700 wives? 300? What, what did the little kid call them? Cucumber vines. Well, 
The one I heard was he had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. And that was probably closer to the truth right there. But you think about that, and then you remember this statement, the acorn does not fall far from the tree. He relived in his life exactly what he had seen growing up. And I think part of that made him extremely, extremely cynical. I think another thing that makes makes him so negative on life is what he experienced in his own life. What do you mean by that, Jim? Some of the, some of the best lessons I ever learned some of the lessons that stuck with me the best were learned through mistakes and struggles that I went through. I'm like Edison. I know 900 ways not to make a light bulb. You think back about the history of Solomon. Two kings before him saw battles all the time. Think about his father, David, constantly in a state of, of war against nations, even in his own family. One of his sons, Absalom, sought to take the throne from him. He had to flee Jerusalem and go hide. Another son, Adonijah, would do the same thing, try to take the, the throne away from him. They all had wars. You remember when God came to Solomon? and said, ask what you will. Tell me what you want, and I'll give it to you. You remember what he asked for? Ask for wisdom. Lord, I, I'm like a little child. Don't know how to go in. Don't know how to come out. Don't know my right hand from my left hand. Let me have wisdom that I might rule over your people. God said, that's fine. I'll give you wisdom. I'll also give you well, far beyond anything anybody had ever imagined. But I'll give you a third thing that neither David nor Saul had experienced during their reign. What was it? Peace. Peace. You will not find any sense of war in the entire reign of Solomon. Some of our most treasured and valuable lessons come in life wars when we have to fight wars and I think that may be part of Solomon's problem I've never had to struggle through things and so I don't understand there's a lot of things I, I can't get my arms around because I've never experienced those things so why did Solomon write the book of Ecclesiastes? And why did God see fit to put it in here? I'll, I'll show you how my mind works. This will amaze you. When I read through the book of Ecclesiastes again, there came to my mind a game show that aired somewhere in the late 60s and early 70s. It was hosted by a man by the name of Gene Rayburn. And the title of it was The Match Game. Any of you remember The Match Game? I, I loved that show because here's what the premise was. They had a panel of celebrities. I think there was four of them. And the contestant would sit there and Rayburn would ask a question, and they would all write their answers, and, and then the contestant would give his answers, and they would try to see how many matched. I want you to pretend today that I'm too cheap to give you a card to write on. So in your mind, write on this. I want you to fill, I want to play the match game with you. I want you to fill in this blank. If I had more blank, 
I'd be happy. If I had more blank, I'd be happy. And I want you to think about that. And to me, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon plays the game with us. He said, show me what's on your card. And I'll tell you why that's not the right answer. Some people would write, how many of you wrote on your card, if I had more time, here we are in this, this season right now, and, and ladies, if you're like my wife, you're wondering how you're going to get everything done before the people come over for Christmas. I, I've got, and husbands, you're worried about the list she's making for you right now. I got a vacuum. I got to pick up. I got, I got, I got, I got. Solomon said, there's a time for every season. And, and you, you're you only going to get so much time. Don't try to push things through. What on earth would make you happy? What on earth would make you happy? Story was told of a, of a king. And he had great possessions. Accumulated a lot of wealth. He just wasn't happy. So he brought all his wise men in and he said, what's missing in my life that would make me happy? How can I, how can I achieve happiness? They thought an old gentleman came up to him and said, King, if, if you had the shirt off the back of a happy man, you could be happy. Great. So he sent all his people out to scour the countryside. They stayed and they came back empty handed. He said, did you not find the happy man? Oh, King, we we found the happiest man around. Why didn't he bring him bring his shirt back to me? King, he wasn't wearing a shirt. And I thought, that's the answer. Solomon says, what's it going to take to make you happy? Turn your card around. Does it, does it say you need money to make you happy? A woman was asked one time, would you be happy if you had 20 kids? Or a million bucks. She thought for a minute. She said, I'd be happy with 20 children. And the guy said, why is that? She said, if I had a million dollars, I'd only want more. If I had 20 children, I wouldn't want any more. <laughs> and and I, I thought that. We, we worry about what we don't have. Hey, turn your card over. If I had more friends, I'd be happy. If I had more possessions, I'd be happy. I like a song by Ray Stevens. Now, he wrote a lot of weird songs. But he wrote one that said, uh, said this. Itemize the things you covet as you struggle through this life. Bigger cars, bigger houses, 
term insurance for your wife. You better take care of business, Mr. Businessman. You know, we struggle sometimes wanting more and more and more. Turn your card over. What's it say? Well, you know, most of us in here are not far away from retirement age. You know, it's it's hard. I I I, I love being down here because I feel like I'm a member of the youth group down here. <laughs> but that's why I, that's why I love to go to NHC on Sunday. If if you ever get a chance, come visit with us at two o'clock on Sunday afternoon. I we Paul, myself, Ken, even even Orman. We're part of the younger crew out there. It will make you feel alive. If I had more time, I'd be happy. Abraham Lincoln, <clears throat> I love I love some of his statements as president. He said, a man is about, is about as happy as he sets his mind to be. Solomon, what, what would make you happy? Well, I, I tried personal pleasure. I tried houses. I've tried wine. I've tried all these things, including possessions, including wealth. Did it make you happy? No, I can honestly say it did not make me happy. We probably turn our card over and the majority of us right now would have written if we're honest. Now, <clears throat> that's why I, I didn't pass out cards today, because I, I, I know how you are, but I'm the same way. I'd write down what I think you wanted me to say. I'd write down something like if I had more faith, I would be happy. Well, that's that's true of all of us. But you have to admire the honesty of Solomon. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the real answer that you would have written on your card. If I'd had more money, I'd be happy. I love a story about, uh, read about James Dobson. Uh, focus on the family. He was talking one day about uh, playing Monopoly with his family. I love Monopoly. I, I just, I love it. It's a long game. Takes forever to play. But you can be greedy in Monopoly. You can, you can play cutthroat in Monopoly. And he said, it was one of those days when, it, if you've ever played the game, every now and then you hit it right and everything works. And you hit on all the properties that you want. And he said the game had been going on for hours. And he owned, this may not mean anything, he owned Boardwalk, Park Place. He had hotels on each of those properties. He owned the railroads. He owned the utility. You couldn't go around the board without having to pay Jim for being on his property. And the more he owned, the more his family got mad, you know. And finally, when he had, he had, he had everything locked up. He said the family got mad and just left, went to bed. And there he was. He said, you know, got thinking about it. Life's a lot like this game of Monopoly. He said, you spend your time accumulating everything that everybody else has and they hate you for it and then you have to put it all back in the box that's life you can accumulate all you want to but when it's over you got to put it all back in the box and it really doesn't matter when you put it all back in the box, doesn't it? 
That's why Ecclesiastes is here. Learn. I don't need to try everything. If that guy in the commercial had called me, he would not be stuck to the post. If I would listen to what Solomon says, life would probably be a whole lot better for me. And Solomon talks about the things that won't make you happy. I thought about that. Happiness is is a strange entity, isn't it? The thing that makes me happy sometimes, the same thing might not make Sonny and Pat happy. Is that what we really want in life is happiness? I thought about a John Denver song, and I, and I love John Denver's songs. He had this thought in one. Talked about the thing that brings joy. That same thing, even in a different perspective, might bring sorrow to me. He wrote this. He said, sunshine on my shoulders makes me happy. Sunshine in my eyes can make me cry. Same sunshine, same person, just a different time in life. The things that sometimes make us happy at other times don't bring that happiness to us. Is that what we want in life is happiness? Solomon, I I would almost suspect found happiness in some of the things he went through in life. But you know what he didn't find in those things? It's joy. Oh, wait a minute, Jim. That's 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 the same thing, joy and happiness. I don't know why, but a couple of weeks ago, I, I read something that said joy and happiness are two different things. Now, they sound quite similar. And I wrote a little article for our program at NHC and gave it to my wife to proofread. She said, that's deep. I said, I must have copied that from somebody because I don't think deep. Solomon tells us what bring what won't bring happiness. Solomon finally understands when he closes the book might not bring happiness, but it brings joy. You know, this time of year we we sing all well, we sing them most of the time outside the church where I, I grew up where it was. You weren't allowed to sing Christmas carols in the church building. Never understood that. I told the story once. A, a, an elder said something to me. I, I made the mistake of singing joy to the world around Christmas. Bad mistake. Bad mistake. First mistake, though, was deciding that to get back I'd wait till July and sing joy to the world in church. Same elder. You don't need to sing that. Well, when do I sing joy to the world? We're going to talk tonight about another Christmas carol. It's in the book. So it's it's okay. If you get a chance, go back and look at it. It was, and I'll tell you the story tonight, but it's it's written back in the, middle 1800s uh it came up on a midnight clear go back and look at that song those of you are picking up a book is 338 <laughs> it's a it's a different song there's something very strange about it though if you read it go back and look at it come back tonight hear the story well how, how did i get on that i'm sorry i told you my mind 
my mind goes sometimes in different directions. Maybe if I turn the page where my lesson is, I get back on it. Joy is found from things that come inside, come from the inside. Because things that bring you joy may not always be pleasurable, may not always be something that makes you happy. Think about what the writer said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, when he talked about Jesus. He said about Jesus for the joy that was set before him. What did he do? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus, what, was that an enjoyable experience for you, the cross? Oh, no, 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 no. Far from it. Joy does not come from external factors. Think about what James said. One of the most difficult under difficult statements for me to understand is what he said. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into trials of all different sorts. I heard a gentleman one time say that that statement by James makes about as much logical sense as telling a fighter or boxer, if somebody throws a left hook at you, lean into it. Makes no sense, does it? Because things that bring us joy are not always enjoyable to us at the present time. Writer talks about the play. It talked about Moses. It said Moses forsook all that he had in Egypt because he would not enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Happiness can be so fleeting, but joy is everlasting. How do we get the joy? Joy is a gift from God. You remember what Paul wrote to the church at Galatia? When he talked about, he, he talked about all the, the fruits of the flesh, all the things that, that are about, that come about because of our fleshly desires. And in the next following verses, he says, but the fruit of the spirit is Love, what's the next word? Joy, peace, all those things. And, and Paul said he's going to start a series of lessons on the Beatitudes. Go back and look at those. And, and I've heard people who say, well, that word blessed means happy. Let me tell you, there's some things in there that that if they happen to you, you ain't going to be happy. Especially when you get down to the last one, when it says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. If you haven't experienced people talking about you behind your back, let me tell you firsthand about something. My wife gets on me because of what I hope she's not listening because I, I explain things in the best terms I know know how to sometimes. When people talk about you and lie about you and make up rumors about you behind your back, it ain't funny. It ain't happy. But he says, you're blessed. You can enjoy, you have joy. 
joy and happiness may not be the same thing. Solomon says, I, I tried it all. I played the match game. I watched you turn your card over. Large family won't make you happy. Oh, yeah, it brings you joy. Most of the time. Someone once said family and fish are just the same. After three days, they stink and you need to throw them out. Hey, think about his, you talk about living in a dysfunctional family. It won't make you happy. Possessions. Queen of Sheba comes to Solomon. He's been told about, she's been told about his, his, his intellect. She's been told about the things that he had. She's been told about all the riches and the magnificence of his kingdom. She leaves and sits with this one statement, the half has not been told. Can't even imagine. Oh, if I, if I could only live longer. That's what we all right now. We're like the gentleman at the birthday party. Reporter said, is it true, Mr. Johnson, you're 95 years old? Yes. Yeah, ma'am. I'm 95 years old. Woo. I hope I don't live to be 95. That's because you ain't 94 right now. Solomon lives how long? Solomon will, will die when he's about 60 years old. And yet, in 40 years, of ruling over Israel. What does he leave behind? <laughs> Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Oh, if I only had a family that loved me. He got one son, Rehoboam. And he will single-handedly divide what has been in existence for 120 years. How much of it did he take with him when he left this earth? Nothing. Naked came I into the world, and naked I will leave the world. Interesting, we were just talking before class about funerals. They're changing. But one thing is certain. I may not be happy in, in a lot of things that go on in my life. But most of the time, I enjoy life. I, I think life, life beats the alternative in a lot of ways. I understand life. It took me a while to get there. But I understand life. Life is a pattern. Someone once said, I, I, have a great, I had a great philosopher who worked for me one time. Uh, his philosophy of life was this. Life is like a Ferris wheel. Pretty good. I said, why is that? He said, you get on and you go around in a circle for as long, long time. And then one day, the guy in charge of the ride stops it at the bottom and tells you it's time to get up. From a man who had no biblical scriptural background whatsoever, that was his philosophy. Were you happy in that life? Well, this guy told me he was happy in everything. Did you have true joy in your life, though? What makes you happy may not be what brings you eternal and everlasting joy. Joy to the world, Isaac Watts, Watts wrote. Joy to the world. Why? The Lord is come. That's where our joy lies. Happiness is fleeting, but that joy remains forever. Solomon, why did you write this book? God, why did you put it in this book? I want to show you how not to live your life. Think about it. I've learned an awful lot from my mistakes, valuable lessons 
I've got the scars to prove it. I've learned a lot of valuable lessons from the mistakes of others. And I think that's what Solomon is trying to get across to us today. Don't follow after me. Do as I say, not as I do. Close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the great examples you give us. The examples we can see in your scriptures that teach us how to live. Father, we thank you for the seasons that bring joy in our life. We thank you for the people who bring joy to our lives. But above all, Father, we thank you for your son who brings true joy to each of us. And we pray that we would always hold him utmost in our minds and hearts. Forgive us when we fail you. Treat us as a father loving his children. Walk with us as we strive to be close to you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I usually say see you next week, but I won't see you next week. <laughs>